Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. This is Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. I'm Gary Heil. Today's guest is James Brian Comey, the seventh director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Before he was the director of the FBI, Jim was the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York and the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. And in the private sector, he served as General Counsel of Lockheed Martin and Bridgewater Associates. Jim is a proud graduate of the William and Mary College and the University of Chicago School of Law. He is the best-selling author of A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for sharing some time with us this morning. Great to be with you, Gary. Thanks for having me. I love the book, Jim. I absolutely love the book. It's a leadership book. Um, as I was reading it, what kept coming to mind for me is the old Saul you heard from your parents. It's not whether you lose the game or win the game. It matters how the game's played. Our parents trying to teach us that values matter. Did I, did I get what you intended? Because it just keeps going off in my head. Yep, I think you got it. And, and I'm, I'm glad you noticed it was a leadership book. Uh, my uh, agents told me it would be too boring to write a traditional leadership book. So I wrote one that kind of tricks people into reading about leadership and the center of it is what you just said. It's all about the kind of person you are and the way in which you treat other people. That's the essence of leadership. Yeah, and it I, I consider me tricked. I had my underliner out and I was doing my thing. But what occurred to me as I read this, that the world that we live in is less and less about value sometimes. I was noting the other day that 84% of all kids cheat before they leave college. The Houston Astros get, get really held accountable for cheating in the World Series. And in this political season, you can't watch an ad without wondering who fact-checked it. It seems to me we live in a world that just win baby is more important than how the game is played. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, wrong uh, only a little and right also a little. I, I think there is an, an epidemic in some places of cheating, a, a loss of focus on what character is, which is the way you act when no one is watching. But I'm at bottom an optimist. I see, because I interact with a lot of young people, people who think about it the way our parents wanted us to think about it. That is, that the only person you're cheating is yourself. And if you're going to be true to yourself and live a happy life, it doesn't matter what other people think of you. It matters what you think of you. And you can't think well of yourself if you're treating yourself with that lack of respect. And it's so critical to having some sort of no social norms about that. You notice, I noticed in your book, um, when you talk about this cheating thing, not so much just cheating, but even evading the truth a little bit. And you're quoting Thomas Jefferson because it is this idea that once you tell a lie once, the second one's easier to tell. So once you start down that road, it, it, it's sort of the slippery slope idea. Yeah, I think that's right. It, like the easiest thing in the world is to convince yourself of your own righteousness. And so you have a tendency to fall into the narrative that emerges if you start lying you convince yourself that that's an okay way to live and that I'm still a righteous person. And so what I advise young people especially is doubt. Doubt yourself. Doubt the narrative you tell yourself. Doubt the story. Question whether you're doing things in the right way and resist that risk of falling in love with your own, your own goodness. Do you think most people have thought a lot about the values that they want to live? Or is it something that they go along with the herd too often? I think very little is time is spent thinking explicitly about values. You learn them by a certain number of lessons, right? My dad used to send me little note sheets with four things I need to know to be effective as a college student, and I can't remember any of them. But and I'm sure they were they had some impact, but most of the impact was just watching. You watch how your parents act, how your siblings act, how your teachers, coaches, 
ministers act and you're shaped by it without even knowing it. That's how individual humans are shaped. That's how culture is shaped. It's all about watching. And that actually puts additional pressure on a leader because they suddenly have to realize it's not so much about what I say. It's about the entire being that I, that I live because they're being shaped by watching me. I used to joke that I, I wished when I was raising our five kids that there were days I could just turn them off, like a turn off a television and say, daddy's going to watch NFL football, drink beer from a bottle and shout bad words at the television. So I'm going to turn you off. There's no turning them off. There are these sensors that are drinking in all the time, and that's exhausting. But for a parent or a leader, it's an opportunity. You know that you are shaping them by the way you are more than what you say. And you're never off stage, right? You're just not off stage. No, your posture is shape, sending a message. What you wear, not just who you say, who you speak to, but the inflection you use when you speak to them. When, you, when you're waiting in line at the Starbucks at your office building, how do you interact with other people? Do you look at your phone or do you turn and speak to the people who are beneath you in the hierarchy? Just that difference sends an important message. Now, one of the most interesting visions of change in a company when it comes to leadership may have been expressed in your book when you talked about the change you wished for um, and were committed to in the FBI leadership ranks. I have rarely read one where I went, I really understood what you were trying to do from the way you described it. You described it as, A, not being very good at first, which was candid, really candid. And then you described this vision of the future, which was, I want people hiring people because they were here. I want to develop leaders in a way that people are jealous of us. And then you went through this list of values. Were they your values that became this list that were, you know, the integrity and decency and, and meaning in lives, the stuff that you actually communicated, were they yours? I hope so. Most of they're derived from watching the people who taught me, coached me, raised me, and led me. And I tended to find that I learned more from my bad bosses than my good bosses. When you look at what the bad ones were missing and what the good ones had, it boiled down to this small list of personal attributes that made them an effective leader. My goal at the Bureau was to start there in evaluating leaders. I learned from another boss I had once that the most institutions hire and promote backwards, right? There are three buckets of things that are relevant, values, abilities, and skills. And most organizations start with skills. What are the things you can do? And then move from there. The, the Bob Stevens, a great CEO I worked for at Lockheed Martin, used to say, we have this epidemic where when we want to find someone to lead a component of our aircraft manufacturing business, we start by talking about how many wings that guy has painted in his career. And he's like, that's great, but I don't really care that much about how many wings he's painted. Does he have an ability to lead other people? Does he have the values that we want in a leader? We should be hiring the other way, starting with values, working through abilities, and then we'll figure out what they've done. If they haven't done enough, we can teach them. But you can't teach values, and you can only teach abilities, especially in a short period of time, in a limited way. That I was hoping to transform the way the Bureau thought about leadership to think in that backwards way. Well, in, in one of the ways you did it, were you as candid as you were in the book with the members of, of your staff and with the general population at the Bureau that they weren't very good to begin with? Yeah. And one of the Bureau's challenges is that it, it inherited the culture of its first leader, J. Edgar Hoover, led the institution for the first 50 of its about 100 years. And that's a huge impact. And the, the culture he helped foster was a fear-based culture where people didn't want to push bad news up towards the director. They didn't want to embarrass each other in front of the director. And so that the culture laid like a wet blanket on the truth in a lot of ways, which is strange to say about an institution devoted to finding the truth, but it was a real thing about the FBI. And so I could talk about that, but mostly I thought I can model the opposite of that and be transparent with the people of the FBI. So I used to write to them all the time, these long emails, about the things I was worried about, the things I thought we needed to do better, the things we were doing well. And I talked to them about my weaknesses and my strengths to show I'll start there in being truthful and transparent. 
And so to answer your question, yeah, I told them, our leadership is not nearly as good as it needs to be. We've for years promoted people to get rid of them. We took into leadership people who are willing to uproot their families and sacrifice instead of thinking about who are the people we want to recruit into leadership. And we were terrible at finding people of color and women of talent and developing them to be leaders. And I said to the institution, look, one of the things I learned from my years in the private sector is that the best companies think about leadership like money. Where is it? What return are we getting on it? Who's watching it? Who's growing it? To become a leadership factory, we have to obsess about leadership more than we do about firearms training, for heaven's sakes. And, and the values that you began with were just inspiring to me. The one that wasn't on the original list, but you bring up several times in the book, I found to be really interesting. I couldn't wait to ask you about it. A, a mentor of mine asked me a long time ago what I thought the first choice a leader had to make. And I remember exactly what I said, but it wasn't all that good. <laughs> and he looked at me and he says, now nah, the first choice a leader needs to make is to choose love or choose fear. Because the value that you choose in that one statement will color everything else you do. I, in your book, you said that love is not too strong a word to describe the relationships you need with the people that you hope to lead. And, and, I, and I noticed that even with people like Faye and others, you talked about they loved and they got love back. Is that a word that you're comfortable using when it comes to leadership? Yeah, it wasn't at first because like all leaders, I'm worried about appearing weak. Or if I'm too kind, am I thought of as someone who's not in control? And the more I thought about the people who raised me or taught me or coached me, I realized that they were people who didn't just like me, they loved me enough to kick me in the pants. They loved me enough to help me overcome. I have a lot of weaknesses, but one of them was long was an ability to convince myself that what I'd done was awesome and drop the mic and dance away. And luckily I had parents and coaches and teachers and religious figures who said, no, it's crap. You can write better, think better, be better. You're settling. Now get your lazy butt back in the gym or the library or the chapel. And that was possible because I knew where it was coming from. They cared enough about me to insist I not fall into the trap that I think results in the great tragedy of human existence, unfulfilled potential. Great getting to the end of a life, never having been what you might have been. And Kindness alone will get you there because it's, it's seductive. It's wonderful to be told you're awesome all day long. And toughness alone will also get you to unfulfilled potential because the horse will be whipped so many times it'll just fall down. I found that when I looked at the people who were best in shaping me, they had both. They had kindness and toughness. They built an atmosphere of not just mutual consideration, but love. And, and once they built that environment, they almost never needed to raise their voice all they need to do is look at us, the team, the classroom, the family, and say, wow, that wasn't our best, now was it? And you melted. Because the last thing you wanted to do was disappoint that teacher, that coach, that boss, because they had built that atmosphere of high standards and love. And so I talked about love. I think there was, like all good organizations, they mocked the boss behind his back. I'm sure they, I was mocked about it. But I used to say, we're going to talk about love in the FBI because it's an essential ingredient in, in creating that environment of high standards and fulfilled potential. You're in good company. The number of people in our study with, that use the word love increasingly, were, I, was, I was surprised by how many really good leaders are willing to use the word love. In, in in a way that shows that you can't just care a little. It's got to be some kind of serious commitment to the people that you hope to lead. Yeah, you have to. And it, look, it's easy in a place like the FBI because people have made and are making incredible sacrifices, including often of their physical well-being or their life to serve other people. And if you can't love people with all their warts, if you can't love people who've chosen that kind of work, I don't know why you're in leadership at all. But I found it's important to create that environment everywhere. I worked for another boss who said it's all about meaningful work and meaningful relationships. And if you can combine those two things, wow, you can do anything. I noticed in the book, you, you bring up a surprise to me, was LeBron James. You brought him up a little bit in the development of, I think, never satisfied, always getting better. Do I have that about right? Yeah, you do. It's not just because... 
we, I resemble him physically. I'm six eight, and that's the resemblance ends right there. I don't have his shoulders, his ability, but I wanted to have his relentlessness. The cool thing about LeBron is, right, 17 years in the NBA, best basketball player on the planet, and he spends every offseason trying to improve some part of his game, which is crazy. Except it's not. When you realize he's not comparing himself to others, he's comparing himself to himself. And I remember, and I talked about in the book, someone presenting to me, because I created a leadership program, and they handed me a survey that showed that the FBI had like, the second highest leadership uh, ratings in the entire intelligence community, which was 17 agencies. And my reaction was, why do I care about that? We are not good enough. I'm not measuring us against the others. I'm measuring us against us. And we got a long way to go. There's so many parts of our game that could be improved. And so I used to talk about LeBron, probably offended uh, people who were fans of the Golden State Warriors or something. But I, I wanted to use him as an example of someone who is never satisfied that they're good enough. Yeah, I mean, greatness doesn't come from comparing yourself to others, does it? Yeah, excellence is a journey, I used to tell people, without end. You never get there. The joy is in the striving. The joy is in the working and saying, can I get better? Can I get better? You can always get better. LeBron, this offseason, he just won the NBA championship, will be working on some part of his game, so in year 18, he's better. You never get to excellence. The fun part is in working hard to get there. And especially in leadership, you would argue that almost no one gets better copying somebody else, right? You have to do it with your own personality and your own relationships, right? Yeah, because no one is like you and you're not like anybody. And so what you, I think, should try to do is distill from watching the bad bosses and the good bosses, what are the things that I think make up a good leader, and then trying to fit those to your personality, to your strengths and your weaknesses, and then putting up guardrails around yourself to deal with those weaknesses. Assembling a team that deals with the fact that you have holes in yourself. There's parts of your game that are never going to be good enough. And so having a clear picture of yourself and then building a team to deal with, especially your weaknesses, is part of being a successful leader. But the huge challenge in that customization is borne out by the fact that we spend between 15 and $17 billion a year just in the United States trying to develop better leaders. And still our engagement numbers in the country are still in the low 30s percent of people that are highly engaged. We're not getting much of a payback from this investment we make in trying to develop leaders. When you, when you read your book, your 10,000 hour journey through trials and tribulations and good bosses are understandable. And there are the lucky few that have some of those journeys that they learn from early in life. But you're at the FBI, you have to try to create some experiences to get people to act like leaders that didn't have that kind of background, right? Yes. And, and the first thing was realizing that leadership and management are different things. The FBI spent a lot of time, as a lot of big enterprises do, focused on management, and that's essential. But if all you are is a manager, you're engaged in a soulless exercise, in my experience, the piece that makes you a leader is harder to talk about and requires talking about things like love. So people shy away from it and tend to default to management. So the first thing you had to do is talk about that being a leader is about being able to manage and then something else, being able to knit a group of humans together, being able to connect them to meaning in their workplace, help someone become more than they ever thought they could have been both individually and as part of a group. And so finding People who have the potential to be that is very different than figuring out who might be an effective manager. So defining the terms was the first thing. Having effective programs and all those sorts of things was really important. But to my mind, the most important thing was modeling it in yourself and in the people you pick and celebrating the aspects of those individuals and, and, and recognizing them as leaders so that people think, aha, look at that. That's what the boss means. And then they copy that. I meant what I said. It's like being a parent. The most important thing that happens is people copy you. And the cool thing about being the FBI director was I had a 10-year term. At least I thought I did. And I would be there for a decade. And so I would be able to spend 10 years working on this every single day. And I literally did. I would go get my lunch every day in the cafeteria. 
and the leadership development program was housed just off the cafeteria. And so almost every day, I would rip open one of the two clear glass doors with this, my sandwich in my hand and shout, leadership! And they'd all bust up laughing. And then I'd go back to my office. They'd see me again the next day, the next day, the next day. So why was I doing that? Because everybody in the FBI heard about it. First, the director was a little bit crazy. But it wasn't just for the people who were in cubicles in there. It was for the people who would hear the stories about this matters. The boss isn't checking boxes. We're not doing this so we can tell the press about it. This guy's not going to give up on this. We better figure out how to be part of this. Wow. And that's so powerful because the stories people tell create a lot of the culture that that people talk about on a daily basis, especially when the CEO's creating crazy stories, right? Oh, yeah. Am I wearing a blue shirt the first day at the FBI? Almost 40,000 people in the FBI. I, I don't know this, but I would hazard a guess. Close to all 40,000 heard about that within days. They either watched the video, which I sent out, or talked about it because it was a shocking thing. Because Director Mueller, who's an awesome person, had worn a white shirt every day for 12 years. And he would just rotate two ties. He had a red one, he had a blue one. And he told me he did that because I said, Bob, don't you have any other clothes? He said he did that because he wanted to serve as a bridge to the Hoover people for whom that kind of dress was important. And I guess I get that. I was trying to build a bridge in a different direction. And so I wore a blue shirt and didn't comment on it, knowing that people would gossip about it. And one day I actually tried not to wear a tie. And I found that put the entire organization into a tailspin. So I put the tie back on. You can only move so fast, so fast in a hundred-year-old institution. But that stuff seems so silly. Like going to get my own lunch seems silly. But those are the things that people talked about and tried to divine the meaning of and made it much more impactful in that organization than any speech I would give. And the, I don't think we could overestimate the power of a culture. And you had a one of the most interesting leadership challenges ever because it seems from the outside that the culture of the FBI was strong. Right or wrong, fit or not fit, it was a tight culture and therefore more difficult to change than most. And yet when you took over from Bob Mueller, as much as you liked him, you wanted it to change somewhat, right? Yeah, I was trying to change with humility, I hoped, the, the angle of the battleship. That it's, I recognize after 100 years, it's, human culture is hard to change after just a few years. But one that's had a century to, to form, you have to approach it with a lot of humility. My goal was simply to devote 10 years to changing things like how the FBI thought about leadership, how the FBI thought about diversity, attracting more people who don't look like this to be part of the FBI was my mission. And I knew that to do that, I had to change culture. And to change culture, I could spend all the time I wanted on posters and training and it wouldn't do any good because the bottom level, the bedrock of culture is the, is the most important thing. That's the unspoken assumptions, right? The underlying assumptions about the way we really do things around here, no matter what they tell you in training. And so I had to get to that bottom level to try to shape it, to align it with the things I would put on the posters, which are inspiring about our values. And the most important way I did that is I keep coming back to this is not what I said, but it's where I went, how I stood, what I wore, who I talked to, so that I would have the chance in 10 years of changing the angle of that mighty ship. And in four years of working on diversity and leadership every day, I think I started to change it, but I'm not a fool. I needed that another six years. I was in Los Angeles the day I was fired to speak to over 700 engineers, MBAs, and lawyers, people of color, who I was going to pitch to be part of the FBI. To be effective, I would have had to do that kind of thing every single day for a decade. That's how hard culture is to change. But you made some inroads on diversity, uh, I would guess. And I think you and I would agree that diversity is key to innovative thought or to any change, to have different views and different points of views and different life experiences. When you came in, the FBI wasn't so diverse, right? Oh, um, yeah, not at all. 83% of the FBI special agents were 
white, so non-Hispanic Caucasian. That's a number that had been growing for more than a decade, and it terrified me. And I wrote to the whole organization and said, look, this is an emergency. And it's not about some political correctness. It's about effectiveness and morality. Obviously, it's the right thing to do from a values perspective to attract people from all walks of life. But we're supposed to keep safe a country that is increasingly diverse, complicated, in my view, more wonderful. If everybody looks like me, we are not going to be effective at doing that. And so this isn't about checking boxes. This is about being effective at our mission of keeping the American people safe. We got to get out there. We need new brochures. We need a more robust social media presence. Great. We got to get out there and pitch to people of talent that you ought to give up tremendous amounts of pay, absorb stress, and risk your life to be part of this. And they all would laugh. And I'd say, it's not going to be as hard as you think because talented young people in America crave work with purpose, with meaning. And we got that coming out our ears. We don't have money, but we got meaning. And we need to show it to them and also show them that although we're not as diverse as we need to be, nobody leaves this family. The FBI is a loving family. And look at our stats. No matter what you look like or who you love, once you do this, you do not leave. We need to share that and invite those people to be part of this amazing enterprise. In a, in a world where social has become so, so much an issue with law enforcement and otherwise, right the things that you did that I was jumping up and down and, and, and cheering for was it seems like you had everybody read or many people read the letter, you know, Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Tell us about that. Yeah, I knew that if we were going to be successful at attracting a diverse workforce, especially black Americans to join and be part of our workforce as special agents, we needed to recognize that white people may not know well the history of the FBI, but black people do. And we need to stare at that history, talk about that history, and own that history. And so I, this generated some controversy with the alumni community. The FBI is a bit like a major university. There's a big alumni community that follows everything. I ordered the creation of a curriculum to study the FBI's interaction with civil rights leadership during the 60s, especially with Dr. King. And then that curriculum was built and everybody going through training had to go through it. And as part of that, they had to come to Washington and visit the King Memorial on the banks of the Potomac Basin. And they had a final essay they had to write for the class, which required them to take one of the 16 quotations that are inscribed on the wall on either side of the Stone of Hope at that amazing memorial. Take one of those quotations and write an essay about how that intersects with the FBI's values. And what was cool about it was, we didn't tell them what to think. We just told them, you must think. And you must think knowing history and focusing on values. And so tell us what you think about the FBI's values in light of its history. It became the most popular course in the FBI. I would go down, I think, to almost every class and speak to them and urge them to read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail because I thought it spoke to the moment and to the FBI. Because Dr. King was channeling during those times uh, a theologian and philosopher I'm a big fan of, Reinhold Niebuhr, who taught Dr. King and taught millions of others something that helps channel a sense of despair into one of hope. Niebuhr taught, yeah, people suck. The world is full of awfulness and evil. So what? All that does is increase your obligation to try and find justice in this world to try and find some measure of balance of power so the weak aren't crushed and so that the disfavored aren't driven into a corner. That's your obligation in light of the darkness in the world. And that was the center of King's message in Letter from Birmingham Jail. I thought it was a perfect thing for the FBI to read, both because it would remind them of their history and also speak to these people who see heartache and violence and death and loss every day and say, your work is meaningful and in fact, it's the most meaningful work imaginable given the human condition. So stay after it and pursue justice. And so I talked about it a lot um, as one of the most important things I've ever read and hoped that people would absorb that and that people think about joining the FBI would see it and think, you know, how to give this a second look. And hundreds and thousands did. I mean, we'd made significant strides by the time I left the FBI involuntarily. <laughs> But in my fourth year, we had a class of about 200 special agent trainees that was 38% non-white. 
which is an unbelievable number for the Bureau. I accused training of hiring actors to fool me, but they weren't actors. They were men and women who wanted to be part of work with moral content. And the FBI was changing. I hope the momentum has been kept up, um, but I don't know for sure. But culturally challenging, right? I mean, not just from an, uh, an ethnicity point of view, but when you're asking people to think differently about it and you're challenging them to look at the letter from the Birmingham jail and to do a deep dive and criticize your history and to speak up, those are cultural audit, uh, you know, cultural changes, aren't they? And in a tight-knit culture, you're asking people to think differently about who they hire, think differently about how they think. That seems to be cultural altering. You're very tricky because Right, the, what culture is is a collection of individual decisions about identity, and people react badly when you threaten their identity. When you, because you're telling them you're not good enough, they see it as a personal attack, and so it's tricky. And the way I tried to deal with that was first talk a lot about my own weaknesses, but talk about how this is about an amazing institution getting better. And the letters I would get from retired agents saying, why are you attacking the FBI? I would write back saying, I'm not attacking the FBI. I love the FBI. But I am better today. I'm 59. I'm a better person, parent, spouse, neighbor than I was when I was 39 and 49. And God willing, when I'm 69, I will be better at all of those things. That's the journey of life. And so I'm not attacking the FBI. I'm simply trying to find ways for the FBI, which is incredible, to be better, parts of our game to improve upon. And so trying to focus it there is a way of trying to avoid the conflict with identity that can be so disabling. But the introspection itself has, every little change you make alters it in some way, I would think, don't you think, Jim? Just, it's one step at a time in a very positive way. It is. The other, the other thing that comes to mind for me around accountability that's very, very visible is who you promote it. So that must have been a difference for you. If, if we're getting a different leader at the FBI, then the whole promotion thing must have been front and center on your radar. It was. And I, I made it literally front and center by removing a big television that Bob Mueller had had on the wall in the director's office and replacing it with a big whiteboard. And I ordered the creation of little magnetic baseball cards to represent with picture and a little bit about bio the 330 top leaders in the FBI. And I organized it in an org chart, and I would spend time every single day in front of that magnet board, a depth chart, asking myself, looking down six layers, saying, do I know her well enough? And asking people who would come into the office, show me who you know. Who's the talent here I need to worry about? And I took the very top leadership, the top 12 people in the FBI to an offsite in my first few months, Bought them all lunch because the government doesn't pay for lunch for these kinds of things and had a talent development discussion, which was the first time it had ever happened in the FBI. And so what was I trying to do? I was trying to both learn about the talent in the FBI and send a message that this obsession with talent is what I expect. Everybody ought to have in their mind a magnet board of their own and be thinking about how are we going to get the people down below ready to lead? Because one of the FBI's chronic problems was. Somebody would periodically panic and realize we don't have enough women or people of color in leadership positions, and they'd grab somebody and move them up to a position that they had not been prepared for. And if the person struggled, it simply fed, fed that subterranean narrative that, yeah, women and people of color, yeah, they're not really ready to lead the FBI. Well, that's not true, except it's true in the sense that you didn't get them ready. You didn't prepare your talent to get them ready. And so trying to drive that kind of habit into the Bureau was something I started from day one, trying to have around my table people who saw the world differently than I did by virtue of their background, their gender, their sexuality, whatever it was, so that they would help me with my many blind spots, with my, the many weaknesses I needed to guardrail against. If I looked around the table and saw a bunch of six foot eight inch white guys from the New York metropolitan area, I'm totally screwed. Not because that isn't a wonderful thing to be. My wife thinks it's a wonderful thing. But I am trapped in me. 
the central challenge of my existence. I can't get out of me, and I can only see things as me. I'm not a good enough leader if I'm making decisions only on that basis. And so building that team, attracting, developing, and retaining those people has to be the obsession of any leader. It's got to be hard work, though, because if there's one truism, uh, I think, in our business, it's got to be that walking up to the director and telling them how you really feel is seen, for better or worse, as a challenging activity, right? You, get, you know, people aren't running into your office, I don't think, and going, um, Mr. Director, uh, let me tell you how I really think. That, that probably is not seen by most people as a career-enhancing move. So how did you work so hard at getting it done? Very, very carefully, and start with a recognition of what is true about the culture, that they're afraid of me, that all people are afraid of their bosses. Everyone knows who the bosses are. I don't care. You hear these stories about, no, we're all wearing hoodies and eating granola and whiting on whiteboards and sitting in beanbag chairs. Nonsense. If somebody's in charge, everybody knows which beanbag chair is the boss's. But you take the, so there's a, there's a hill up to the leader no matter where you work. At the bureau, it's a cliff. Because that culture was built, that fear-based culture by the first director. You wanted to not visit the Wizard of Oz. You didn't want to have any contact with him. And when you did, you dressed well, you stood up, you spoke with a slight catch in your voice, and you were careful. And you didn't embarrass any of your fellows, right? And they were, in those days, they were all fellows. And the, one of the great sins in the Bureau was in front of the director to correct, correct something somebody had said, a factual statement, an observation. Well, think about the director. The director is sunk in that situation. You're not going to hear the truth. And so knowing that that's true is the first step. And then trying to figure out, how do I flatten that hill? And it's the only person who can do that is the, is the person at the top of that hill. And so finding ways to flatten that hill was my obsession. And I did it with the way I dressed, the way I sat, and that's something else I had to abandon. I tried to sit in different chairs around the director's table, and that I realized that was way too fast for them. And so I would sit in the same chair, but not wear my jacket. Big deal. Begin by asking people personal questions. I actually went around the room at the FBI. I started in September. In October, I began by asking the senior leadership of the FBI, there were about 30 people in this meeting, what was your favorite Halloween candy when you were a kid? And has that changed? And why? And they looked at me like, is he drunk? And so we went, and I said, you know, I'm going to start. I'm going to start. I'm a Reese's peanut butter cup person. Uh, you know, I've become more of an almond joy person as I've gotten older. I don't know what it is, but that's who I am. And I went around the room, and so this is silly, but I did things like that over and over again to get them to relax, to try to flatten that hill, to send a message that you're safe with me. You're safe with me. I will never hurt you. And then I tried to develop sources of information to, to triangulate on that because I wasn't a fool thinking I was going to change this culture in a short time. So I would assign my chief of staff, always sit at the opposite end of the room from me and watch, see their body language, follow them out in the hallway. What aren't they talking about that they should be talking about? And like any good FBI person, I developed sources throughout the organization. I would recruit sources, low-level people that I met in the line at the Starbucks or people that I met somewhere, and I would tell them, I will protect you. Tell me what's going on. And so they would email me to give me a, a way of triangulating on the culture that was closest to me to try and find that truth and help me find other ways to flatten the hill. And, and part of flattening that hill had to be your view of having a sense of humor. It just has to be part of it, isn't it? You have to. And, and I have long thought of sense of humor as a marker of what I think is an essential attribute of a boss, a measure of humility, because laughing makes you look silly. It's an admission to those people down the hill from you that they said something that surprised you or pleased you or that you didn't think of. And so it's a, it's a marker. And it also helps people relax. The most important humor is self-deprecating, aiming at the person at the top of the hill. It's never at the people down the hill. You start rolling rocks down that hill, it is not a recipe for hearing the truth. And so laughter has a way of calming, making the person at the top of the hill seem less frightening, and knitting together a group of people. And given the stress you encounter in all leadership roles, but especially in the FBI, 
you have to laugh or you will cry on the inside and that will do you great harm. You know, in a, in a world, Jim, that is changing so quickly and uh, everybody talking about the need for more speed, you've thought some about the speed of decision making and the problems with trying to make quick decisions when you haven't really thought through the issues. And that's got to be a tough thing for many leaders today is there's more and more pressure to come up with a quick response. And what advice would you give them? Doubt. Doubt until the last moment, doubt after that. Doubt is not weakness. Doubt is wisdom. I'm not talking about finger in the wind kind of doubt. I'm afraid to make a decision, but a recognition that I'm flawed and everyone around me is flawed. My perception, my reasoning, I'm plagued with biases. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Let that lay on you until the moment of decision because it will force you to seek other perspectives, other facts, other arguments to maximize your chance of being right. And even after you're done, doubt. Doubt that you might have gotten it wrong and find ways to think about the decision you just made because you could still change it. Now, look, I know as well as any leader that often, maybe always, the hardest decisions are the ones that have to be made the fastest. I've had to make nightmare decisions that might affect an election, for goodness sakes, and I had to make them. There was no, it wasn't an option of putting the, your pillow over your head and this will go away. But Knowing the deadline, doubt until the very moment you make the decision, and never fall in love or convince yourself of your own righteousness, because that's a huge danger when the stakes are highest. You're trying to protect yourself, your own identity, so you convince yourself that you're right. Doubt until the very end and after. A couple quick questions, Jim. What are you reading? I'm actually reading three different things at the same time, which seems weird. Um, I'm reading, <laughs> I don't want to depress people, but I'm reading Stephen King's The Stand, which I last read as a freshman in college. I'm rereading it because why not? It's 2020. <laughs> uh, I'm also reading a book, <laughs> I'm so depressing, on immunity and inoculation that was recommended by an author I admire, John Green. And then I'm reading a short story by Ernest Hemingway, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, because I read that John McCain read that 9,000 word story aloud to his staff the night before he lost the presidential election in 2008. He knew he was gonna lose and it's about a leader dealing with loss. And so I'm just at the very beginning of it, but I thought, you know, I really ought to, I know I found out that McCain carried it around in his briefcase and if he, if he did that, it's something I ought to read. So I'm reading those three things at the same time. Wow. Two leaders, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you most admired? Hmm. I think I would say Reinhold Niebuhr uh, as one of them, philosopher, theologian, who helped me as a young person see and re-channel darkness. I arrived at college with a dark view of the world because a terrible thing that happened when I was a senior in high school involving a home invasion at my home. And he helped me channel that and see that Leadership was about accepting the darkness in the world and trying to achieve justice, not just in spite of it, but because of it. That was your obligation if you were gonna go on living. And that had a big impact on me as a leader. So I'd say Reinhold Niebuhr. And I guess I would say probably, maybe my first boss, who I talk about in my book, I worked at a, during summers and during high school, I worked at a supermarket. And I saw great leadership, although I didn't think of it that way, in a boss I had, a guy named Harry Howell, who taught me as a young stock clerk what kindness and toughness looked like and creating an environment of love and high standards. I saw that for the first time in high school, and I've gone back to think about Harry many, many times since then. And with Harry... It isn't necessarily the words they use, too. When you describe it in your book, the love that you had for him almost seemed to grow as you got older to understand more of the lessons he was teaching you. Is that right? Yeah. I, when I was young, I, I worked for Rudy Giuliani when I was a young federal prosecutor. Uh, he was different then. I suppose I was different then. Um, and I thought he was so cool. 
this boss who was on the front page of the newspaper, who was always in charge, who you were nervous when you went to go see this imperial leader. I thought, that is so cool. The older I got, the more I realized that's an enormous mistake because that's a steepening of the hill. That's not the path to the leader hearing truth and developing great people and inspiring them. And then it was more the people I didn't even notice were leaders, people like Harry Howell, this guy who looked like the great Santini, Robert Duval, the brush cut and pants too high and a black belt on khaki pants and shiny black shoes. That guy who could look at me and both reprimand me and send me a message like, I really care about you without even speaking. Just by looking at me kind of with a tight smile, shaking his head when I made a mistake, made me want to please that guy. And so I've gone back to Harry Howell's leadership as an example that I was too young to appreciate. And now I realize is the answer to being effective and building a team of people who care deeply about each other and want to be great. A Gen Z leader, millennial leader comes to you and says, Mr. Director, one piece of advice, just one you might give me that would shorten my trails, what would it be? I would tell her that the thing that is in shortest supply in human experience and especially in leadership is humility. And you have to find a way to embrace humility without it being disabling, without crushing your confidence, but finding a way to balance confidence and humility because worrying about your own ability to be right will help you develop great people and great teams. It will help you create environments where people will tell you the truth about all things, but especially about you, and that will make you better. There'll be so many pressures to submerge doubt and humility and act tough and be in charge, resist it, embrace humility. There's too little of it in our world. Jim, before we go, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you just one thing about the new book that comes out right after the first of the year. It's called Saving Justice, right? Yeah. Have that right? Why? What can we expect? I'm hoping that in a plain spoken, story driven way to trick people into learning about the values of the Department of Justice. I think they have been severely challenged and eroded in recent years. And so I want to illustrate through a bunch of pretty cool stories that I've never told before about cases I've done throughout my career to illustrate those values, why they matter so much and offer a path for restoring those values to making them central again and restoring the faith of the American people. And the subtitle gives it away. It's called Saving Justice, Truth, Transparency, and Trust. Telling the truth, being transparent, will earn you the trust of the American people and help you keep them safe. And so that's what the new book is about. Jim, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us this morning and for your service to our country and for your wisdom about leadership. As I read your book, I found myself underlining it and I found myself thinking differently. And I, I thank you for that. And thanks for sharing some time with us. Well, thanks for the conversation. I really appreciate it. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Washington Speakers Bureau for making these conversations possible. We hope that through these conversations, leaders will find new and innovative ways to create cultures that are not only more effective, but help people reach closer to their potential.